Kaisa, Carol, and Imogen Aga. Yeah, Annie, as always, let's give everyone a couple of minutes to settle and get their audio set up so you can hear everything. So as per usual, my name is Stanford. I am a doctor, yoga teacher, also training under Colin for yoga therapy. And as you can see, I'm bringing myself and my chaotic wall with me to tonight's topic. Okay, hi, Colin. Hi, my name's Colin. Um, I'm a yoga therapist and I'm really enjoying Stanford's chaotic wall behind him, actually. Um, and I'm, I'm living in sort of a, a strict order. I've positioned myself directly in the middle of this radiator um, so that I remain warm, but so that I've got a good structure around me. Um, so today's subject matter, OCD. Um, I, think, I think today sort of the question for me about OCD is, is a number of things. One is um, firstly, what is it? Second, what are the symptoms of OCD? Um, Third, I, I, what can be, how do we explain it? How can we break it down more? Fourth, what can we possibly do about it? Um, does that make any sense, Sanford? And, and why on earth do we choose OCD over all the other conditions that can start with O? Well, first of all, I don't think there's actually that many conditions that can start with O. Um, but it stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And I think one of the reasons why I chose it is because there we can't use the term OCD all the time. I mean, at least I do. Like, I'm just being a bit OCD. You know, I would like to over tidy things. I like to um, organize and make sure and confirm plans with people, double, triple. Um, so I think, I think that's part of the reason why, because it, it, it is actually clinical mental health disorder, but at the same time, it's also a very um, everyday common term. Mm -hmm. So I think finding out the distinction between the two is going to be quite interesting and perhaps quite important for a lot of people to think about. But also at the same time, uh, I think I want to touch on this because I've seen a little bit more presentation during the whole COVID and pandemic as well, um, which is kind of natural, you know, when we are going through a period of health scares, obviously we will be slightly more worried about um, our health, how we can make ourselves feel better, how we can make ourselves, make ourselves a bit safer as well. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the reason why I wanted to touch on OCD. And I think, I think there's kind of two parts into this definition what OCD actually stands for. So first of all, obsession, which is the first part. Um, so it has to be an unwanted, unpleasant thought, maybe image, maybe urges that repeatedly enter and kind of intrusive into one's mind and uh, mental health. And usually will cause uh, feelings of anxiety, disgust, unease, uh, so a lot of fearful response. Um, sometimes it can be uh, related to religious ideas, contamination, orders, or symmetry. So I think that is one of the big uh, um, signposting for me is how, it, how I can differentiate um, with the everyday term where it is an unwanted and unpleasant uh, origin. There's something that causes unpleasantness in one's mental health. The second part is the compulsion. So it's the repetitive uh, physical behavior or mental act. Sometimes some people can literally just count in their head or you know, mentally go through a certain sequence and then um, in order for them to temporarily relieve the unpleasant feeling that was uh, brought on by the obsession. Um, they, I'm most of the time actually aware that it's not really logical. It's not, sometimes it's not really related. Like if you're worried about, I don't know, the train's gonna hit the platform and actually you're gonna go through a sequence in your mind and then you think it will all be better. They really understand it's not logical. It's, there's no sequential um, um, causality in, in the events. However, by doing this ritual, they actually make themselves temporarily feel better. But I think one of the key points is, is actually a negative reinforcement, which means actually by doing the act or the mental act or the physical behavior, it's actually most of the time not very enjoyable for them as well. So I think, again, that is a big part of it compared to me being overly organized, where actually it's quite enjoyable once I've organized myself or organized my 
fridge shelves um, for people who suffer from OCD, the act themselves actually is not enjoyable. Colin? Interesting, really interesting. There's a couple of interesting things that um, you said there. First is the, um, the, the obsessive thing, which is a form of attachment. There's a, there's a form of attachment in place. The compulsive thing, which is that there's a, a form of desire. And the disorder aspect is that you, you've got, so you've got this repetition of process that's going on, which becomes a huge issue in people's lives. So it, in one way, it's very easy to say what OCD is, but in another way, I think it's actually quite hard. I, I really actually think it's quite hard. I've, I've kind of been sort of touring around this subject matter for quite a while. And um, as a beginning definition, I, I like, what you said, I, I'd say it's a psychological disorder. It, it's where we, re, we repeat behavioral patterns, um, which are often built on the inherent chaos brought up by not knowing. So there's a kind of like, there's a repetition of behavioral patterns, but they actually founded on something. There's a foundation of those. And for me, the sort of first aspect of this is that they are they're built on the inherent chaos. Um, brought up by not knowing. It means that I don't know something. So like you use the word ritual, I really like that idea of a ritual because it, when we define what a ritual is, a ritual is, is to close one thing off to allow something else to then be opened. So this is how a ritual works. And in a way, the repeating of checking something to close something off or cleaning something or organizing something or put something in place is to close something off to allow something else to open or something else to happen but almost in a way we're stuck in in a loop or a pattern of actually coming to do that and I want to sort of build just a little deeper today to look at um, a little more understanding of the stickiness of attachment and the mobility of desire and how they actually come together it's it's it's, it's like I said to someone the other day um, I don't drink but they 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 was they were they asked for an espresso martini and I said, but this is two opposite forces that come together and they cause a lot of trouble. And in the same way, these are two opposite forces that come together that cause a lot of trouble. And I just want to explain how they come together and do this. Um, but for me, the first thing is this, this kind of, this repeated behavioral pattern that are built on the inherent chaos brought up by not knowing. And, and that's, the not knowing is, is in its, all its forms. It's not knowing how to deal with emotions. So we default into a pattern of actually coming to, oh, I've got to clean something because I, I, I feel a particular way. I don't know how to do it. Or I go through a cycle of, of, of opening and closing doors and locking things and checking things. Um, it, it can be not known with regard to traumas, how traumas are and how traumas are embedded within the system or not known with regard to how to actually come to deal with things. Um, so we don't have a knowledge to deal with things. So we look to put a structure in place in order to keep us safe. So in the second idea around this is that it, things are out of our control. And so we actually need to sort of try to exert some control and order because there's a perception that things are out of our control. And so for me, this is kind of the next idea that's sort of present with regard to OCD. And we've the third thing is that we've also got a feeling that we don't have our own personal inner power anymore. So we, we've lost our inner personal power. So what we want to do is we want to take power and order over something that responds predictably to us. So there's a predictability within this. If I order this in this way or move that in that way or position these in this way, I have this kind of predictability over it. And the Next thing, the fourth thing is that it, it, often this is combined with a lack of self-confidence. There's, there's a, there's a, we question what we believe in and there is a lot of kind of a doubt and anxiety that comes with this. Um, and so for me, it, 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 in the fifth sort of stage of this is that we want, and there is also a desire to bring a sense of safety and stability to our lives. So this sense of, safety and stability that we want to bring it, it, we're looking to we feel that there is a need to create some form of order or structure um 
So we repeatedly do things like actions, we organize things, we order things, we repeat rituals, um, all to a stage where it becomes a huge issue for us in our lives. Um, so here I'm, I'm describing sort of in a way multiple clients and multiple experiences within, within this. And each person has conflicting and unsupported forces within themselves. So, and they're actually using repeated patterns of behavior to exert some form of management that actually can appear as forms of behavior such as rituals um, in precision or in order or in a structure. And it becomes a way of managing relationship with the outside world or managing relationship with ourselves. So I think it can express covertly or it can also express very obviously as well um, and I think it can be considered normal which is what we we're saying and also abnormal as well I like what you said about um, that quite often people are very aware of it and in some ways I think that people can be aware of it and I think in others they can't and but I, I'll also this, this inability to control one's behavior as well forms part of this too. And I have to apologize because the ambiguous nature of my answer, Stanford, it enacts life itself. And actually OCD is the opposite mind to this. Does this make sense? Yeah. That's fair enough, and I can't wait to hear you expand a, a little bit more on that. But I really like how you've broken down the different areas of how you're going to tackle this topic. Because actually, one of the posts that I found uh, in my own research, I think from a lot, uh, it's quite common quotes, I think, uh, from a lot of people who've been affected by OCD, um, they will usually say, it is not about being tidy, it is about having no control over your negative thoughts, it is about being afraid of not doing a certain way will cause harm. So I think it really, really captures on the few things that you already signposted, like about the not knowing, losing control, regaining control, and how to um, kind of get on top of that um, situation, even if it's just mentally and repeatedly. Um, so I definitely ask you a little bit more on that. Um, and I think when you said it can be normal uh, as well as pathological, abnormal, I think it's right. Um, I mean, most of us probably have been through a few exams that is quite scary in our lives. And I remember most of us, especially medical students, you know, we have quite a few exams. Uh, we will have quite <laughs> repetitive, intrusive thought of failing our exam. <laughs> that is rather unpleasant. And most of us develop kind of a little bit of ritual. I mean, myself included, like if I always bring my books with me, but I will not read it like an hour before, or I go into the exam this way, or I bring this pen with me because it's my good luck charm. Some people even say, and if I take this bus that ends with a prime number and get a coffee from that shop uh, with that pastry, I will be fine for this exam. Again, it really captures that, that illogical sequence. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us do are aware that you know getting on a random number of bus getting certain pastry coffee or pen really wouldn't guarantee um our passing of the exam or failing of the exam but i think we we all have that kind of belief at points when we feel a little bit desperate i would just say from personal experience and i think i think that is something that i can relate to in a bit and also say yes in some way it can actually also be normal I think we all have been through that but how common that is in our life I think that is that is kind of the bar um, in mental health term we will say if these kind of symptoms so um, the, the intrusive thoughts that unple unpleasantness and then the repetitive um, mental act or physical behavior persist for most days uh, every day uh, for about two consecutive weeks then you start saying and it is causing significant distress to someone's um, life and mental health then you start diagnosing with OCD so that's the other part of it but that sometimes can also contribute to you know if you have a predisposing personality so if you're slightly more um, 
what we call neurotic personality, um, slightly more meticulous and, method and methodological, then you are slightly more easy, um, more likely to be predisposed as well. Um, another thing would be like life event, as we said already, the pandemic can be one, but at the same time being bullied in school or you know in workplaces, being abused, being neglected. Um, also, you actually um, pregnancy, childbirth as well, because it's a um, mental health disorder that's most common, uh, or at least most of the time, appear, uh, present itself uh, around puberty and early adulthood. But another period that's very common as was well during pregnancy, because mm -hmm. again, I think it's another period of change where, especially health, is more a bit more concerned as well. So yeah, I think I think that uncertainty really do play a part into how this kind of presentation can come. But would you mind, Colin, go, going a little bit more about, I think, if you can, going to the fear and not knowing, or the fear of not knowing in yoga perspective, because I think that is something that's really very important in this presentation. You've asked a, I, I, I hope you don't mind if I go into a monologue. Go ahead. I got my water. Brilliant. Um, so what I think I'll do is I, I will jump back and look at symptoms and expressions. But I, it, it's kind of it, why I said it's kind of in one way it's quite easy to describe. In another way, it, it's not so easy to describe. Um, is that it is a psychological disorder, but it's actually it's it, it, the psychological disorders that are presented are the opposite to the yoga states of mind. So in one way, it's, it's kind of like an extreme opposite, but in another way, it actually can show how yoga and meditation practice associated in helping with this condition. So a healthy mind, um, a healthy mind can hold and it can let go and it can pick up again and it can let go again. So what this means is that within the meditation process, if we take the opening of chapter three of Yoga Sutra, Desha, Banda, Jadasya, the capacity to use the mind, to be able to, let's say I'm talking to you, I focus on you, but someone comes into the room, I look at someone coming into the room, I communicate with them, then I come straight back to you. This is a healthy mind. The mind is able to hold, it's able to grasp, but it's able to let go engage with something else, engage with it, hold it, let go and go back again. In fact, the meditation process is one of beginning to refine this cycle again and again. But what if in the opposite way, we hold something and we can't let go of it, and we actually repeat this again and again and again, because we can't let go, we repeat it, but we feel that it actually keeps it safe. It becomes quite obsessive because we've got this attachment in place. And then we've also, the natural ability to attach becomes intensified. And so when we're looking at fear, when we're looking at uncertainty, we're looking at this brings up to the surface numbers of different things. And we grab onto something that we believe will keep us safe. And it's what we actually do. It's the basis of actually all of our patterning. The way that we create patterning is there in order to keep us safe. So we've got this patterning in place and this natural ability to attach becomes intensified. And there is also willpower in a healthy mind. And that willpower in a healthy mind in an unhealthy way can become a compulsion. It can become a sort of a, a very strong pulling force. So the force that it becomes will become almost unnatural. So this for me is the first sort of stage within this because in meditation and yoga, we're training to hold onto something let go. And here there's a constant holding and repetition. So it's almost like we've got the, the, the natural process of taking something in, moving something through, allowing something to come out holding, letting go, suddenly becomes stuck. It's like having a car that's kind of not running quite in the right way. So, it, it, and it's by understanding the mind that we can help in yoga, because actually, officially, when you kind of look at a lot of the sort of 
causes of OCD, they're not known. Yes, we've got an idea of symptoms, but actually we don't know a lot of the causes. So it, we do know that various different traumas fall part of this. We know that um, there are other different situations that can actually create OCD. But we have to start to understand and know a person to know their, and know their history, to understand their background, to understand why it is that they hold on to things in the way that they hold on to, or they create these safety cycles and control mechanisms in the way they do. So in, in, in yoga, we very much look at different states of mind and different kinds of mind. Because it's by understanding the states of mind and kinds of mind that we start to understand how things are moving, how things are being held on to. So for example, a state of mind can be an agitated mind. So I can become very agitated and it's a state of mind. I can have a very heavy, dull mind. I got up this morning and I don't know what happened, but I got on my horse this morning and I thought, oh my goodness me, I feel really, heavy. you know, that I just needed, it's like you need about two shots of coffee. Um, you can have a normal mind, which is where you, you and I are attentive, but then suddenly what happens is that we get distracted by something, then we come back to it again. So this is a kind of like a normal mind. Then we can have a very focused mind where I'm able to focus on the subject matter in hand, or I'm able to focus on you, and you're able to focus on me. So there's kind of like a focused aspect. And then there is a kind of like an intensely engaged mind. So what we've got is we've actually got different states of mind. And why this becomes important is that when we start to look at something like OCD, we're starting to understand the, have to understand the states of mind, the kinds of mind that are involved, because they become companions to things like not knowing and fear. And they, they set the cycles up again and again and again. And if we want to start to unravel these things, we've got to begin to understand the nature of the patterns that people are taking based on the situations they're finding themselves in. So what are the triggers? So the next thing for me is to do with the kind of mind. So is it a sensory mind? Is it an intellectual mind? Is it an egotistical mind? So is it all about me? Is it, in, is it a conscious mind? Is it a subtle mind? Is it a very pure mind? And then what we start to do is we start to get combinations of this because actually these minds don't operate as state and kind of mind at the same time is that we start to get, and this becomes important in OCD, because OCD is, is laying lots of different firm controls and rhythms and patterns in place. And so we have to understand about rhythms, we have to understand about patterns, we need to understand about controls and mechanisms like this. So this is what we're starting to do when we're looking at states of mind and kind of mind, because they become combined. They become combined so that you can have, let's say, an agitated, egotistical mind or you can have a, a heavy dull intellectual mind and so these are all diff these differing states and these different kinds they play complementary and supporting aspects to one another now one quality of any mind is movement and so Movement becomes very important. So if you think about a compulsion, it, it's, 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 a, it's a movement, there's a desire, there's a movement in place. And with healthy movement, a healthy mind, it uses movement as dynamicism. There's a dynamic aspect to what's going on. And it uses that dynamic aspect to progress. But with an OCD, the dynamic aspect doesn't create a process, it creates a cycle. And then what we've then got is we've then got an, also a movement is intensity of expression. And the intensity of expression gives passion. So it actually gives a rise to passion. And also within movement, we get energy. And the, what energy does is it gives enthusiasm and stimulation. And something else that needs to exist for there to be movement is that th there's got to be a sort of a, almost a, a kind of like a foundation of reality for something to start to begin and also for movement to occur there needs to be a readiness to get any type of commitment for something to happen now in the opposing way 
in the opposing way, what we then have is that we've then got the idea of non-movement. And the idea of non-movement within a mind means that actually with something, with non-movement, you get, you use organization to get structure. Okay? So it opposes the movement that we're getting. And so what you're seeing in OCD is we've got the movement on one side that gives all these things, but on the other side, we're starting to put in place organization to give structure. And we're using inertia to actually get a firm foundation. And believe it or not, non-movement gives tranquility. It actually provides tranquility, passivity. It gives serenity, it gives safety. And also with the weight that non-movement gets, we get an idea of authority. So it gives this idea that actually we are in control, we're in charge, we've got some idea of authority with non-movement. So with this non-movement, we also get limitation, we also get the capacity to put a framework in place. Now this, in these both aspects of movement and non-movement, when they work in this way, it's quite healthy. And we get these healthy combinations of these things. Well, what happens is that when they go wrong, we start to get aggression, we start to get impatience, we start to get things that are unrealistic, we start to get irritated, hyperactive quarrels on the one side. On the other side, we start to get immobility, a lack of enthusiasm, lethargy, painful boundaries, containment. And in the case of OCD, what we're actually getting is the repetition of movement again and again and again in order to recreate the missing support that non-movement actually provides. Are you okay with my monologue? Yes. Cool. Going good. Keep going. Um, they don't put me in that position. No, I, I'm just thinking about your teaching on movement and non-movement. I was thinking how the control in some way actually, well, in a way, no, it is, it is in a lot of way creating the problem even deeper. Because I was saying, I'll look at it in slightly more maybe philosophical, but at the same time, physic um, point of view. Um, you know, Newton's third law, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Because the, the condition is, you know, if you have to put in a certain form of compulsion, certain forms of control, okay, I will only ever feel safe if I do this certain things a few certain amounts of time. At the same time, what is created is a condition for feeling unsafe. Because if this standard or if this um, behavior or act is not met, you instantly feel unsafe. So sometimes part of part of the treatment is, you know, um, for most mental health issues, uh, we could use uh, CBT, content behavioral therapy, and actually understanding the the creation of your control, the creation of your compulsion. I, I, we know that's involuntary. We know that is not something that you can actively help usually, unless you actually have additional help. But it's also in, at the same time creating the condition that you will deepen the feeling of unsafe. And as you said, you know, if we actually slowly move away from you need to do more and more and more to make yourself feel safe and actually in some way you need to do start doing less. And I, I really, really agree because you kind of slowly uncoiling the, the winded clock, actually you slowly get the tension off the person or off the mind a little bit more. So I really, really got the sense that and I, I, I took a slightly different direction, but I, I really, really couldn't agree more. And I think in our treatment, we couldn't agree more as well. And the other part that I thought was very interesting is about your um, kind of definition or your expansion about fear and attachment, how our mind has different states and can grasp and let go. Because I think fear in my understanding and in a slightly more Western point of view, it's definitely the state of not being able to let go. Because as you said, we all have fearful response. That is innate and that's normal. That's our kind of our sympathetic nervous system. Um, the fight or flight or protection, you know, freeze um, response. And that is absolutely normal. However, I think fear a lot of the time as um, actually an interesting TV series that I watched once before, um, it's about fear itself. You know, actually the object or the events that you're fearful of 
sometimes if you look at it retrospectively, there's not much you should really worry about because it will happen one way or another. But actually at the time, the emotion itself is what's stopping you or causing the issue is not, in some way, scarily, is not actually related to what's happening around you. It's your memory of what has happened in the past. It's the emotion of being afraid that it will happen again or what could have happened uh, that kind of created the problem. And I think you're right in saying how that is the mind unable to let go some certain experience in the past certain memory certain that pattern or I don't know scars that was left in our body and we're just uh, reliving it and in some way you're right and even if it's unpleasant actually for our body going through the familiar you know we are creatures of habit actually it's in some way safe you know we we've been through this fearful response once before we kind of know what they will feel like it's unpleasant, but even if we go through it again, it's kind of okay. And I, I think that that is the difficult part that um, in the minds of how you actually get through fear itself. Um, we have exposure therapy, um, which sometimes is helpful for OCD, uh, especially OCD, as you said, can uh, be associated with other conditions such as panic attack or malphobia. So in these cases, to kind of those controlled exposure therapy. So usually, say, if there's a specific scenarios or object that they're fearful of like let's say a spider because i mean most people probably don't like spider um what you will actually do is like show people so show someone or actually probably ask them to close their eyes and imagine they have a spider in the room or being quite close to a spider and then open their eyes and realize there isn't one then what you may do is um when they're feeling very calm and say you show them a picture of spider or even a drawing to begin with so it's quite unrealistic and then make sure that they feel okay. And then you show them slightly more realistic one, then slowly and slowly you introducing a spider into the room and maybe closer and closer to the end that you may even be able to get the person to hold the spider. And, and that is in some way kind of slowly unlearning the fear response is slowly letting the body and the mind know that actually the fear in some ways unproportioned to what is actually happening around you and then you can slowly slowly make yourself feel safe again not easy not always effective but it, it is definitely something um that we use and also i think the principle of it is probably something that we can take home from as well is which is how just to understand the the, the, the basis of the fear and that is the emotion itself or the experience itself is probably what is causing the problem. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to say that you have articulated so well um, a number of things. Firstly, fear. Um, and the opposite of fear. The opposite of fear is belief, faith, trust, conviction, confidence it's the opposite of fear so when we take the the situation with the spider uh, which i absolutely love because actually it mirrors the process that we work with with ocd so it's exactly the same um we there's no quick fix and i also haven't found a yoga or meditation practice for OCD because it, it, it's very, very unique. One of the key things is when we start working with this condition is in exactly what you just said is that we don't deny it at all. We're not trying to fight it in the slightest. We're realizing it's going to take a huge amount of time and we're looking at laying down new patterns of behavior without creating conflict with old patterns of behavior. So it's, so yeah, I really appreciate what you just said there. Um, I just like to jump back to some of the symptoms because the symptoms that you're discussing are, are kind of interesting because there's this idea of high anxiety that comes and anxiety is, it's fear, so it's fear combined with imagination. 
So it's like a cocktail of fear and imagination combined together with a bit of ego dropped in. And so that what happens is you then get sort of, a, you know, there's this different proportions and you, you've got high anxiety, which is one of the symptoms that accompany it. And there's also sort of a detachment from other people that occur as well as part of this. And also the person's also on high alert. So there's this kind of stimulation. There's this high alert sort of symptom too. And I've also noticed and, and been told that, that there's, a, there's, there's an inability to understand how to behave. We don't know how to behave in a situation. So almost that we're looking for cues on how to behave. And there is also an ability to be real and present with other people. You can't really be real and present, you can't engage. It's almost you, you're creating this ritual or organizing or doing things repeatedly again and again and again. And that becomes all of the attention. So you're not able to engage with other people. Um, and there's, there's a, also a deep feeling of being very, very overwhelmed. Um, and so for me, all, all of these things are, are combined together. Um, I have a couple of quotes that are quite interesting. Um, one lady said that when you're in it, it's very hard to snap out of it. And very hard to find your sense of self. Another one is asking questions. How do we come out, keep our sense of self? What is it? we don't believe in. And another one, we don't believe in our judgment, everything becomes a question. So, here, I think that what we have is we've got, we've got a series of symptoms that are expressing themselves. Lots of different symptoms that are on the surface. But underneath, as Stanford you're saying, is that underneath this, there is numbers of things. There's this fear that's going on. There is this relationship with uncertainty. And there are these patterns that we're coming to create. And then the question is what to do about them, how to deal with them. And We're working to empower someone to take back control that they're actually putting into the activity and bring that control back to themselves. So it means that there is a process, a process where I'm not looking to fight with their behavior at all or focus on it or deny it. And I'm starting to then lay down lots of different techniques for them to experiment, like you said, with the spider. It means that the basis of a lot of this is trust, is faith, and this is conviction, because I'm not handing my power away to a pattern or a situation or something to gain control. I'm starting to move from outside to inside. So, I have to create different experiments which are done safely to keep safety and to build confidence. And the key for me here is all about building confidence. I've got to find a way to build confidence. I've got to find a way to build trust. So every single thing that I'm asking someone to do is to do this, is to build confidence. So I give them something they can do, something that can surprise them. They may not feel that they can do it. And it means that looking at all of the patterning that they have, how they're holding on to things, when they, let's say, get a situation where someone is looking for perfection and they're saying everything has to be a particular way, or it has to be perfect, is that. I agree, I start to teaching them everything is perfect. So I teach them in a very perfect way. And then I start to introduce slight imperfections in things. So they start to be more uncomfortable with the nuances of things. 
And so all the time we're starting to meet everything where it is and then starting to change the way that the person engages with the pattern that they've got. Does this make any sense, Stanford? Yes, and I think you answered uh, one of my questions for you, which is why I've been seeing more um, OCD as well as um, depression and anxiety, I think through the COVID um, and after the COVID pandemic as well, because I think you said very nicely how there is a state of detachment from both other human, but also the social human interaction as well. And I think I think you can expand on this a little bit more because you you have such a nice way of doing this. Um, how our interaction is actually reference point out for ourselves, um, in our belief in how, uh, how you know our relationship with ourselves as well. And I think through the pandemic, I really felt because of the social isolation, it, it almost reinforces all these beliefs and fears uh, or belief or fears and control and how the compulsion can help a lot more without the interference of other interaction. Because I, I think usually, especially from talking to my patients, when they're outside and they, are, um, they have to go through these rituals, they will feel uncomfortable, uh, which is kind of a response. It's a checking point um, to understand that actually this is illogical. This may not be the most helpful thing for myself. And that there is some boundaries where the patient can in some way from these reference points help themselves thinking, actually, this may not be the most helpful uh, behavior for me. Maybe I need to do less of this or I need to find another way to solve this or I need to seek help for this. Whilst in a pandemic, because we are so isolated, we, we lack these reference points. We, we almost indulge ourselves. <laughs> well, I mean, I certainly have indulged in the pandemic and lockdown. But um, for people who have OCD, you, you, you can and you have the opportunity to indulge in your uh, actual OCD and ritual themselves. And it, it really, as I said already, it's a negative reinforcement, the uh, compulsion they um, so by doing them more and more often and you kind of get the temporary relief, you really in reinforce the patterning from happening again and again. So yeah, I really like how you answer my question without me asking it. Yeah, but you've, you've, you've said something else that's kind of interesting because it, it's not just you've got the circumstance, the situation, so the environmental factors that are creating this. So you've got the environmental factors, you've already got the OCD in place. The, the environmental factors will actually increase the OCD, but you've also got the environmental factors that will trigger other people to create those mechanisms because they can't ask for help and they don't realize what they're doing. And they find themselves in situations that they've never found themselves in before. So if you find yourself in a situation that you like this, you've never found yourself in before, you start to, create habits or patterns like to put you know go beyond just putting everything in order but starting to create ticks and rituals and habits and expressions that are without the how should i say without the distraction of and the engagement with the outside world you're left to rattle around on your own and it's really 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 challenging and really hard and it's why I think it's actually really important to engage as much as possible with other people if there is this. And do you think there's a certain personality type, let's say introvert or extrovert, um, that with OCD, or do you think it can come in both different forms? I, I think the, the most instinctive answer would be introvert, but I, I truly think it's actually common in both. I don't think an extrovert will be any less likely to have OCD just because it's not, as I said already, if you're someone who's more likely to akin to neatness, to be more meticulous and be more mythological, then you're more likely to go into these patterns of behavior happening. But that's not necessarily someone who's introvert or extrovert because either can have these behavior or this tendency, same as women and men that, or, you know, whatever gender you want to identify with. Again, I think, I think there's no 
strict correlation. As you said, it, that, there is no cause of OCD that we have found just yet. There are genetic predisposition, which means, you know, if you have someone in your family, especially direct family, first degree family, who have OCD, you're more likely to have, have it. But at the same time, there's no one particular gene that is associated with, the, uh, associated with it. There's no one particular brain area that really pinpoint where OCD come from. And I think we try to associate um, low serotonin level to OCD, which again makes sense. Uh, low serotonin, uh, serotonin level, as most people know, also is related to depression. And we have already established that OCD is not particularly a pleasant or enjoyable state. So I, I think I, if I'm going to put my hands on heart to say which personality really predisposed, I can't say. I'm, I, I will put equal money on both introvert and extrovert. I would agree with you. And I would also say that they'd be slightly different in their expressions and also with the personalities involved as well. So the personality and the expression of the personality would be slightly different. The tick or the ritual or the process of the behavioral pattern will also be slightly different based on the personality. In yoga, we look at three different ways that we have patterning. The first is hereditary, as you know, and it, it's, and thank you for saying that because, it, you know, it's interesting to see the correlation between patterns. And I, I first came across this in a, when I was working a pupil referral unit. So it's a, it's a very interesting place. Um, it's where they put young people who don't fit into normal society. And instead of um, working the, to integrate them into society, we segregate them from society and we put them all into a place together, which I think is a, a very interesting approach. Um, it, it, so I was working in there and there's, you could, it was so obvious the hereditary patterning that was passed on because a lot of it was the way that people did things, how the actions they came to do things, how they wore clothes, how they did stuff, how they emulated and learned. Even if they didn't know parents, there was a combination of this hereditary emulation and learning from someone else, but also the way that we then put our own take on things, that we learn to do things ourselves. So there becomes three combinations of this that starts to happen. And I think within some of this, you've got OCD, which is hereditary, but also OCD, which is to do with creating mechanisms because we don't know how to create other mechanisms or deal or process with things that we need to deal or process with. Does, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Um, so this, this is, uh, and I think I saw in this environment, I think I saw quite a lot of different behavioral disorders that were there because we didn't know how to do something, but we created a way of dealing with it that worked for us and made us feel safe. Yeah, and actually, while you're talking about that, I was thinking as well. Um, so I, I recently moved to a children and adolescent mental health unit, and um, especially on the uh, neurodevelopmental side of the specialty. And I was reading the new research that seems to indicate that uh, during the whole COVID pandemic, especially related to social media, more ticks and Tourette syndrome as well. So when you use the word ticks, I, I really think, oh, may, maybe there is association as well. Because again, we're talking about a population where they sometimes are less able to express uh, their fear and emotional response as well. So again, I, I, I'm literally completely stabbing in the dark here but perhaps some some of these presentation of ticks which yeah with repetitive movement or Tourette when it can both be physical it can both be um verbal as well they mm -hmm. can actually some of them be OCD as well they are repeating a certain behavior to help them feel safe in a such an unsafe environment and time in our life but interestingly that also links to um the use of social media because that's what the um, uh, research is trying to link is not just the pandemic itself, but also it's during the pandemic that I think one of the app called TikTok, um, there are loads of video trending. If you search for ticks or Tourette's, there are loads of trending videos on there. Um, 
I, again, I'm not expert in TikTok, so I have no idea how to use it. But I think in some way, the, my personal experience with the social media, yes, is meant to help us socialize. But interestingly, because through the medium that we socialize, in some way you actually, or at least I feel, some of the time actually more, even more isolated because I, I interact by myself and not really having the full five senses human interaction. You know, I don't get to actually see the other person. I don't get to touch or hug the other person, eat something or share the room, the smell, the color, the lighting with the other person. And, and these are all elements that I really believe constitute a whole uh, human interaction as well. So I don't know, again, stabbing in the dark here, maybe actually we need to look into is social media actually making us feeling a little bit more isolated because we don't satisfy all our senses and is actually have a relationship with OCD. But sorry, yeah, I complete, complete no, no, no. You, you, what you've There's also, what you just mentioned is very interesting because for me, the, the pattern of engagement with the actual platform itself. So by the ritual of actually picking up the phone, by going through and, and, and going through all the, the device or whatever, and going through the actual things themselves, actually forms a sort of a compulsive disorder. And, you know, if you start to create a post and you keep going back, how many people have liked it? How many people have liked it? What's going on with it? I, I think there's, a, there's, there's these, uh, these things happening. And I, I think that it, in, in one way, it, it's, we have the best of humanity and the worst of humanity at our fingertips. So I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing with my tangent. No, One no, thing I can no. say, last time when I have a chance to do this webinar with you in person, it's definitely feel very different when we're doing it through the screen again. Um, so, I, so if we could sum up what in your, um, how do you feel? So I, I feel that today we've begun to explore OCD. We've created a, a almost a, a framework that's completely complementary um, because we almost in a way we, we can see that it's very varied. There are sort of many different levels to OCD. There's this OCD light and there's OCD kind of very, very heavy. We've also understood that it, it, it's, it's built on uncertainty, not knowing, uncertainty, um, in Sanskrit, avidya, um, it, it, it's built on this kind of, this, this foundation. Then we've got an idea of fear um, that's involved with this as well. Um, we are seeing that there is a, a, almost a mismatch with regard to movement and non-movement. So rajas and tamas within the system and how those are operating. Um, we are, starting to see that through our behavioral patterns, which is the only way we can express ourselves into the world and express ourselves with ourselves, is that we're starting to lay down certain rules and cycles of rules that we repeat again and again in order to gain some idea of control and keep ourselves safe. So there's an imbalance of confidence and belief within the person as well. So uh, we've also, looked at the to approach this there isn't a quick fix it's a slow process so it, it, it's a it's a process of a slow movement to create more confidence to build success through the engagement of different routes of happening so that there is a, a changeover from external influence as being the aspect of control to internal comfort and confidence. Yeah, and I think from my point of view, um, OCD has a um, significant mental health issues. Uh, it is common, about 1% of the population, slightly more in children and puberty, um, so about 1 to 4%. Mm. Um, I think the core feature is actually the unpleasantness of the experience itself. Um, the ritual or the, uh, the compulsion doesn't actually bring a sense of complete joy and safety. It's actually temporary re relief. Uh, as we've gone through so many times already, there's no 
definite cause, I would say. It usually it's so multi-layered and multifaceted and there tend to be something slightly deeper, which is why, as Colin said, there's no quick fix. Um, medication like antidepressant can help in time of instability to bring some stability back into the mental state. Um, but from our point of view, from the Western medical point of view, um, usually it can be helped with exposure therapy or CBT or support groups. So these are all longer term uh, methods where it kind of need to be teased out why certain thinking pattern, behavioral pattern or certain fear or certain fear of losing control is ingrained into the person and how we can help them not necessarily forget about it or you know release it, themselves from it, but how they can accommodate and acclimatize and slightly lift better and away from that state, I think will be come my summary. <laughs> thank you, Colin. That, that was, I somehow realized it's not an easy topic. And thank you, but you make it very, very enjoyable. <laughs> thank you to you too. Um, it, it's not an easy topic and it, it, it really is. It's like you said at the very beginning, it, it's almost OCD is in one way, it's an accepted and throwaway, you know, it's a throwaway word, you're being so OCD, you know, it, it's, it's in one way it is, but in another way, there's so much beneath the whole thing that needs to be uncovered. And I think we've got OCD light, and we've got OCD. Um, so yeah, I definitely you. have a bit of OCD light. <laughs> I think we all have. Um, but thank you, oh, hang on a second. Okay. No. <laughs> Next time is another mental health issues personality disorder. <laughs> how, how did we move from from where we were? How did we get to personality disorder? You know, we started with anger, so you know it's not a, a natural <laughs> progression. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, you have all been lovely as always. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And Thank you. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys for personality disorder next time. Bye. Thank you.